Our modern conception of time, with seconds, minutes, and hours, as well as various calendar systems, all represent artificial constructs that have been developed over millennia. Many of these timekeeping systems exist to subdivide a more natural interval involving days, years, and the changing phase of the moon, but these operate through several independent configurations and movements of orbiting bodies that don't fit together as neatly as we often think they do. The Earth is spinning, and a solar day is technically defined as the interval it takes for a point on the Earth's surface to face the Sun at each subsequent rotation. From our point of view on the Earth, the more natural way to mark this interval is from one sunrise or sunset to the next, and people everywhere have always been attuned to this cycle. Astronomically, a year is defined as one orbit of the Earth around the Sun, but ancient people could only perceive the year indirectly by what could be observed on the surface of the Earth. Without axial tilt, our orbit of the Sun would be discernible only in relation to the stars, with different stars becoming visible as we orbit, and indeed some cultures have marked the year this way. Axial tilt, however, makes the Sun seem to rise and set further north or south, either higher or lower in the sky. This causes fluctuation in the intensity and amount of sunlight across different parts of the Earth over the course of a year, in turn driving seasonal changes in many environments. Besides seasonal changes in the environment and the gradual change in the amount of daylight, the sun on the horizon gives a visual clue connected with these changes as it moves between maximum positions to the north and south, which we call solstices. Solstices mark the solar year from the time when the tilt of the Earth's poles are aligned either directly toward or away from the sun, marking either summer or winter solstice, depending on the hemisphere. Have you ever been on a long journey and asked, how much longer until we get there? or compulsively check the clock during a dull interval to see how much time has passed and how much remains? While seasonal changes in the natural environment, the position of the sun on the horizon, or the appearance of different stars would be well-known markers of the passage of time over the course of a year, ancient people at various times and places likely also had some desire to measure the length of the year in some way. There could be many uses for having such a measurement, including simply being able to track the progress of a long interval that is harder to perceive by marking it with shorter intervals that are more familiar. The most obvious way to do this would be to count how many days fit into a year. Counting the days from a seasonal change in the environment connected with plants and animals could give a rough idea of the length of a year, but due to complex weather and temperature variations, such an indicator would not always occur at the same interval. Because the actual year is driven by Earth's orbital position, even without knowledge of Earth as an orbiting planet, some visual indicator caused by orbital configuration must be used to track it. While this could be done by counting days between the first appearance of a certain star from one year to the next, using the position of the sun on the horizon was also likely of interest because of how closely its warmth and the amount of daylight received was connected with seasonal variation. Also, due to precession of the Earth's axis, the time of year when a chosen star first appears won't match the solar year after a few hundred years. A horizon marker could be set up and the movement of the sun on the horizon could be tracked relative to it. If the marker is not placed at one of the maximum solstice positions, it will be reached twice in the year, once going north and once going south. But if counted only when reaching the marker from one of those directions, a very good count of days could be obtained. A more likely place to start counting days might be from a marker at one of the solstice positions that the sun reaches once per year before slowing, seeming to stop, and then turning back. However, this apparent slowing and stopping would make it hard to know exactly when to start and stop counting. This could easily be overcome by setting up a marker for a position earlier than the solstice when the daily change in the sun on the horizon was still perceptible, and then counting the days from the marker to the stopping position and back. 
Half of that interval is how many days have passed since the solstice, and the same procedure could be used to adjust the count at the end of the cycle. In reality, it is the non-solstice marker that is being used again for the actual counting, but with the added advantage of being able to fix the solstice position within that count. We know of ancient monuments that were aligned to the sun on the horizon at the solstices, and marking these maximum positions does not require keeping any day count. But knowing the length of the year in days would be very useful in marking time until a solstice would again occur, especially in planning and coordinating any celebrations or rituals in the surrounding days. After obtaining an accurate count of the number of days in a particular year, if the horizon marker was used, then ignored, and the days simply counted from then on, it would soon be clear that something was wrong. After several years, the sun would not reach the original counter or a solstice marker at the expected time. This complication arises because the number of days in a solar year is not a whole number, but includes a remaining fraction of a day. The same applies to a sidereal year counted relative to the stars. In either case, this amounts to roughly one quarter of a day, but in practical terms, it means that in most years, the sun would seem to reach a horizon marker after an interval of 365 days, but each year it would fall a little bit short, so that after around four years, it would be a day late. Because of this, some years would seem to be 366 days long. Many calendars, including our modern systems, correct this error with complex rules to add an extra leap day in certain years, and not just every fourth year, because the fractional day is not exactly one quarter, and further adjustment becomes necessary over longer intervals. Ancient people, especially those already accustomed to marking solar positions on the horizon, might avoid all this by simply continuing to use a horizon marker to keep the count adjusted. Even keeping an adjusted count of 365 or 366 days each year would likely have been quite tedious and still doesn't mark the passage of time in small enough intervals to be easily visualized. The phases of the moon provide a very useful visual marker of the passage of time over a relatively short interval, but an even number of moon cycles doesn't match up with the number of days in a year. Although many cultures have used calendars based on the moon, they require complex adjustments to keep them even loosely matched up with the solar year. For our purposes, let's try and divide the solar year itself based on the journey of the sun along the horizon between the extreme solstice positions. How should we divide it? The year is already divided roughly in half between the two solstices. If we divide the horizon itself between the solstice positions, either towards the east where the sun rises, or toward the west where it sets, we will get a position that divides the halves of the year into quarters loosely related to our modern definition of equinoxes, roughly halfway between solstices. Unless the horizon is relatively flat, this method only works for a given location as it is complicated by local topography. If the angles to these points on the horizon were further divided, this could help visually track the progress of the sun, but would not be connected with the passage of time, since the position of the sun doesn't change on the horizon at the same rate. The sun seems to move faster toward the middle, and slows down at either end at the solstices. This is because the sun appears to move along a circular path in the sky defined by the tilt of the Earth's axis and orbital plane. When the sun is at the top or bottom of this great circle, it seems to move horizontally in relation to north and south, but at other times, it shifts along a more diagonal angle, quickly reaching further north or south in the sky. Instead of dividing the horizon of a particular location, how could the year be divided by actual intervals of days? If we want to keep with the solar year, it could be divided into any number of smaller parts, but the uneven days makes this difficult. One method might be to just round the days off so that they can be divided easily. 
A few days would be left over, and the solar marker could be used to restart the count. Alternately, to divide the year as evenly as possible without remainders, intervals of slightly varying lengths of whole numbers of days could add up to the correct total. A horizon marker would still be useful to keep this count matched up on leap years. This could work quite well without any regard for where the sun is on the horizon, but it is likely there would be interest in having the solstice positions match up with the chosen intervals. Fitting the intervals to the solstice positions on the horizon, or marking any of the other intervals on the horizon, would soon reveal another complexity that arises. The orbit of the Earth around the Sun is not a perfect circle, but slightly elliptical. Even a small deviation from a perfectly circular orbit means the Earth travels fastest at the point on the ellipse nearest the Sun and slowest at the far point. This is not the same as the apparent slowing, stopping, and reversal of the Sun on the horizon that occurs at solstices, but an actual small difference in the speed of the Earth as it orbits the Sun so that it covers certain portions of its orbit more quickly than others. The orientation of the near and far point, and thus the faster and slower part of Earth's orbit, is not fixed in relation to where the solstices occur in the orbit due to precession that changes which direction Earth's axis points in space. Sometimes the fastest point in the orbit coincides with winter or summer solstice or one of the equinoxes. Other times, it is somewhere in between, such as the current configuration with the near point, called perihelion, occurring a little after the northern hemisphere's winter solstice. Winter solstice last aligned with the near point around 1246 AD, so that the time from one solstice to the next was equal. Over 5,000 years earlier, around 4000 BC, the orientation produced the maximum discrepancy with 187 days from winter to summer solstice, and only 178 days from summer back to winter, as the sun moved faster over that interval. This produces a difference of nine days that was likely detectable when counting from even a roughly determined solstice to the other when attempting to count the days to divide the year. Interestingly, when the difference between solstices is at the greatest, the days that fall halfway between both the longer and shorter intervals coincides with our modern definition of equinox with the Earth oriented 90 degrees to the Sun, measured as zero degrees declination. Equinox as we think of it may not apply to ancient cultures, but a rough midpoint in time between solstices was likely of interest, and although this only matches true equinox during a specific orbital configuration, the date produced by counting is within about one degree of the correct value, and once this middle date is determined, it would work for anyone keeping the same count regardless of horizon variation as opposed to a visual position on a local horizon. If people at this time were attempting to divide the halves of the year between solstices into smaller intervals of slightly different lengths, they would have to assign more of the shorter intervals into the shorter half of the year. This would also naturally happen if both solstices were roughly determined and the unequal days between them were divided and subdivided. If the position of the sun at these interval divisions was marked on the horizon, the sun would pass through all of them twice over the course of the year, stopping and turning once at the solstice positions on either end. Although the sun would reach the markers slightly earlier in the shorter half of the year, the positions marked would still be quite close together. By placing markers over time as the sun passes through on the way northward or back towards the south, a sort of average horizon position and the corresponding ideal interval of days could be determined. To get the horizon positions to match as the sun passes going north and south, it might be necessary to shift by a day or two from the exact day of solstice but solstice positions are hardly detectable over so few days anyway. The whole system would still need to be kept synchronized because of the fractional day of each year, and this would best be accomplished with one of the more central horizon markers, ideally one corresponding roughly to our modern concept of equinox when the sun moves fastest. 
After around four years, the sun would clearly be a day late to such a marker, and so the next counted interval would wait one day before resuming. It is likely a tally stick of some kind would be kept as well, but horizon markers alone could show interval progress of the year once the system was established, including leap year adjustments. The days of a year can be roughly divided in half between the solstices, and dividing again at a midpoint in time, closely coinciding with the equinox positions, gives quarters of the year. Although these intervals are not completely even, further subdivisions can produce intervals that are closer in length as the differences are distributed between smaller periods. Further divisions of the quarters of the year into eighths produce dates often called cross-quarter days, these dates, if marked by the sun on the horizon, are closer to the solstice points than the midpoint because the changes in sunrise and sunset positions is faster toward the center and slows down toward either end. How far back in time such divisions of the year might originate is a matter of ongoing investigation, but Alexander Tom carefully plotted the distribution of declination values along possible intentionally aligned features of various ancient sites in Britain that strongly indicate the cross-quarter dates and even possible further divisions into 16 parts of 22 or 23 days each. Other investigations also show strong connections to these subdivisions of the year in various ways, such as the range of days when light enters a tomb or possible interpretations of rock carvings. Some of these ideas will be further explored in other Archaeoastronomy database videos and your support is greatly appreciated in helping this work go forward.